Hi everyone, welcome in to the Life on Purpose conference. You're gonna need your Bible and this conference handbook right here, it looks just like this. Come in and take a seat. My name is Joe and I'm gonna be the speaker for the first message here and it's gonna be entitled Jesus' Mission if you wanna to turn to page one. Now, I have an interesting job. I drive around a lot of people, but these people are actually dead because I work for a funeral home. <laughs> I, I asked a cop one time when I was filling up gas, I said, uh, hey officer, if I have somebody in the back, can I take the carpool lane? And he had another motorcycle officer right next to him and they kind of looked at each other. They had no idea what to say and he said, I don't think it's legal, but I wouldn't pull you over. <laughs> so, you know, we kind of get to do what we want and I have a very interesting uh, car, a very interesting hearse at my job. I think it might be the oldest car that anyone in this entire room has driven. If you've driven a car that's older than this, please say so. It's a 1956 Cadillac. Anybody? It's a real old car and it is a hot rod. Y'all ever heard of hot rods? You know what hot rods are? I mean, they're loud, they're powerful, they're fast. This one's got a 496 Big Brom Stroker engine. Does anybody know any of those words? Because I don't. I barely got it out right there. But that's the engine and it's got 550 horsepower and that thing, when I started up, it goes But it doesn't like to go slow. It only likes to go fast. If I take it slow, it sort of starts yelling at me like like It's like anger is coming up from the engine. I'm like, I'm sorry, but like everybody's in front of me walking. I, I, I'm, I'm on a big incline, I have to go slow, but it gets upset. But when I hit the highway with that thing, whew, goodness, that thing gets going. Yes, it is a hearse, and that thing gets up to 95 miles per hour on the highway. I'm talking, I'm talking California highways. I've got people, I've got people that have straight up seen the car, and they are hanging out their window trying to get a picture, almost falling out of their car. And I got to admit, it's kind of fun. Everybody knows when I'm on the highway, that car's a little bit different than the average car, and it's going fast. And my goal with this conference, our goal together is that we would all be inspired to start moving a little quicker into Jesus' mission, that we would live a life on purpose, that we're gonna get going fast, that we're not gonna take things slow anymore. We're gonna live with a purpose, our lives, our hearts on fire, lives on purpose. And like it says on the front, you're gonna unleash your anything but ordinary kingdom impact. So we're gonna start on page one. And just to get an idea of the format of how this conference is gonna work, basically you've got your Bible. This is the perfect word of God, inerrant. And then we've got our conference manual that has a bunch of fill in the blanks. You can see here that I've got a bunch of additional notes on it. And so I encourage you to make it your own. Make this conference manual your own. You don't have to just write in the blanks. If you've got a scripture that pops in your mind or an example or some random thing, or maybe a, a recipe that you just remembered, I don't know, whatever you want, make it your own, personalize it. That's how it's gonna run through. Let's run through the first blank just to get started off here, kick it off. Your life legacy is meant for high and lasting impact. That's impact. But only Jesus can show you how to strategically aim at what will matter most. And why can only Jesus do that? It's because he is the author of your salvation, the finisher of your faith, the alpha and the omega. He is the one that's full of grace and truth. He is the king of the universe that we follow and that has saved our lives. Hallelujah. He's such a good God. Oh, sorry. and everybody who believes in Jesus will not be put to shame. So if you're afraid at any point during this conference and saying, I can't do it, I'm just not built for this. I'm to whatever the excuse is in your mind. Just know that scripture promises that you are never going to be put to shame. If you're running after something that's in God's heart, he's going to bless it. He's not going to leave you out there in the cold hanging. Jesus stated his ultimate aim. And it was the second blank here on page one. His mission was to seek and save lost people. He didn't see people and say, I don't really care about this person. He didn't see them as an object. He saw people as souls, eternal beings. And so often in our culture, we're so focused on the here and now, the temporary. Jesus went completely against that. And the Bible goes completely against that too. It says, don't focus on things that are temporary. You need to look up and focus on things that are eternal because those are the things that really matter. 
I'm sure you guys know of a ton of people in your lives that are struggling without Jesus. There's a philosophy called absurdism that a bunch of honest atheists, honest skeptics, have put together. They've found the end of their thought process, and it's this. Humans seek meaning. Naturally, we want a purpose. But to them, the world is cold, and there's no answer. Now, we know that's not true. We know that Jesus Christ came and saved us and granted us eternal life. It's a free gift from God. But the unbeliever in the world doesn't know that and isn't aware of that reality. And so the Bible says the way of the transgressor, the way of the sinner is hard. I mean, it is difficult to live life without Christ. Has anybody lived life without Christ? I have for literally 25 years of my life. I did not live with Christ. And I can tell you, I was depressed, anxious, sad, angry, constantly. And it was only when Jesus Christ came into my life that anything changed. I mean, he changed everything. Let's go down here at the very end of our page. I just want to point out that this attitude of people that Jesus picked up on is exactly the attitude of the average unbeliever today. It says in Matthew 9, 36, when Jesus looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. People are running after meaningless things. The biggest thing I think modern culture is running after is money. Money, a temporary thing. Another thing that American culture especially loves to run after is popularity. How many followers do you have on your social media? That's how people judge often how good a person is. How much money do you make? How many people follow you? That's completely opposite of what Jesus wants. I've pursued a lot of meaningless things in my life. Um, but one, I wonder if anybody in the room can relate to this. I actually, for a long time, was very gluttonous. And I was pursuing um, comfort from food for a long time. Not just like a, a good hearty meal, but I'm talking like excessive overeating. So much to the point where I was affecting my local grocery store's economy. Like I would go in and I would buy out the cookies and I would return the next day and the cookies are gone. And I would be like, oh man, this is... so that's when I learned that the cookies get delivered on Tuesday. <laughs> I was going after some bad things and things can get a lot worse than that. <laughs> sorry. Oh man, I'm sorry. The Bible says, in Romans 1, that his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature are clearly shown when we look at nature. And so everybody knows that there is a God. It's just people are rejecting him. And we can't stand still anymore. We can't just sit here and do nothing about it. We need to use Jesus, the hope of glory within us, to help us figure out how to walk in this world full of anguish and hopelessness and bring hope to them. I mean, that's what Jesus did. He went around and preached and told people the good news. And that's what he told his followers to do too. That's what we're going to learn in this conference, how to do, how to share the love of Jesus in our everyday spaces. What is missing? I mean, we know there's a Bible. We know that God reveals himself by nature in general revelation. However, there are still people that are unbelieving. What's the problem? What is missing? Jesus identifies it clearly in Matthew 9. And it's going to be on your conference manual, but you can also open up your Bible to Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38 is where we're going to be primarily today. If you want to look at it in your own Bible, feel free to, but it is on your conference manual. It says this, starting on page 2. Then Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly, the Lord of harvest, to send out laborers to his harvest fields. Laborers. Those are the two blanks you want to fill in on your conference manual. That's what Jesus is saying is what the world is missing. That's what the world's greatest need is. Laborers. Laborers. Why does the world need laborers? I always thought the world just needed more money. I just need to throw money to solve homelessness. I need to throw money to solve you know, famine. It's just money. No, Jesus says it's not money. 
It's laborers. It's people that are going to be feet on the ground doing the job. That next blank right below it. Jesus said that there are great needs everywhere, but he identifies the one thing that is missing, and it's more kingdom laborers. Laborers. It's the concept of this whole conference, everyone. This is Jesus' mission. This is not a mission that the makers of this book, Forge Ministries, have put together. This is not their mission. This is Jesus' mission. This is straight out of the Bible. And Ephesians 5 says, find out what pleases the Lord, test what is pleasing to the Lord. Well, Jesus is saying it right here. He's saying, you know what pleases me? If we had more harvest hands in our laboring fields, if we had more laborers out there just doing the work, find out what pleases the Lord, read Matthew 9. It's right there. Become a laborer for his kingdom. He didn't say that we need more eloquent speakers or gifted musicians or upfront speakers, upfront people. Just because I'm up here, it doesn't make me special. He didn't say that's what we need. He said we need more laborers. And our culture is so inclined to worship the people that are up front. Celebrity worship. I know you've seen it happen. It's happening constantly. People will mindlessly ask themselves, well, what is this celebrity doing? That's their whole life. They just idolize this person and they don't look at God for their, for, to live an abundant life. They look at their idol. They look at Taylor Swift or for me, one thing that I had to get sanctified on was I thought sports were sort of out of the realm. I thought, oh, sports, you know, it's not a, it's not this weird singer. It's a sports. It's a little bit different. But if I'm idolizing an athlete, if I care more about what my team's quarterback is doing than what God says, that means I'm idolizing him. And that's wrong, too. So we need to get over this upfront worship, this celebrity culture, and also get over this comparison culture. Because we so often tell ourselves, if I'm not upfront, that means I'm not doing anything at all. If I'm not standing up at the stage, if I don't have a microphone on me, that means I'm less than. Less than the speaker. That is not true at all. Again, I am not special at all. Anyone that is up on a stage talking to you or to any group of people is not special. Not even one bit. In fact, through surveys and the Bible saying that spiritual gifts are evenly distributed, it's been found that only 8% of people have the spiritual gift of leadership. That means only 8% of your church is going to be gifted in leadership and doing those sorts of things. And that, again, it doesn't make them better. It just gives them a different role. Because the whole body of Christ is gifted in different ways, and they complement each other. I have a friend who is named Joey. And Joey, for a long time, he didn't know what his role was in the body of Christ. And he thought that because he had a st st stutter, he couldn't do anything. He thought that meant he was stupid. He thought that meant God couldn't use him. He thought, I'm trash. And then the pastor got up there and said, actually, spiritual gifts complement each other. And each of you are uniquely made. And we talked afterwards and he asked me, well, I don't know what my ministry looks like. I don't know what my giftings are. He came up to me almost in tears, downtrodden, depressed, frowning. I don't know what I am. I don't get it. And I said, Joey, what are you good at? And he said, well, I usually greet people. I said, that's great. That's your ministry. He went off and talked to other people. The next week, he got encouraged by so many people in that church that he was an excellent greeter, that he was out front with the biggest smile I swear that church had ever seen. Everybody loves that kid in the way that he greets them. And in fact, I got to be in a small group setting with him. And we went around. And you know, when you go in a small group, here, the one thing they ask is share a fun fact, a fun fact about yourself. And if you're me, you might be dreading it. Oh, a fun fact. I, I'm not sure what to say. Joey, when he shared his fun fact, he said, my fun fact is I'm a greeter at the church. And I said, has anybody seen him greeting at the church? Literally 12 young adults lit up and said, yes, I love him so much. I love Joey and he greets me every single day. He was so pumped to have found his unique ministry. He was so pumped to have found out that he didn't have to be on a stage to make a kingdom impact. And I gotta say, I was rooting for him for so long. You know, do you guys ever have those people in your life that you just can't help but pray extra for or think more about? And you just think, Oh, I just want to see them happy. 
that was Joey for me. And I've seen God move so powerfully in his life, I know that he can move in your life too. You just have to realize that you are going to be gifted specifically the way that God has gifted you. You are going to labor for his kingdom in the way that Jesus designed you to. You just have to say yes. You just have to say yes. If we turn our page to page three, we can see the next blank. It is laborer is an every person word. This applies to literally every single person on the earth. You can be a laborer. You don't need anything special. In fact, Jesus chose such unspecial people that it's recorded in the Bible in Acts 4. When, when his disciples were in front of the council, they said, these people are so ordinary, but it's obvious they've been marked by their time with Jesus. I can just imagine them rolling in with not the nicest clothes, not the nicest speech patterns, and they just couldn't help but think, there's still something different. We still are looking at them for some reason. There's something that's just not the same as the whole world. These guys, something's different. And they knew the biggest difference was that they had been with Jesus. And if you spend time with Jesus and you're intimate with Jesus, everyone around you is going to be able to tell that too. And you can share that intimacy with God with other people. Because you're ordinary. And Jesus chose ordinary people. He didn't go around and just choose, you know, he didn't go to like the top rabbinical schools and choose the 12 best rabbi. No, he went and he got fishermen, right? He didn't get the cream of the crop, you would call them. He didn't get the people that had, in our modern day, you know, millions of followers on social media. He didn't get those people. He got the ordinary people that were in ordinary places. And he's calling you to come into his kingdom too and labor for him. You just have to say yes. Laborers are not seeking microphones or spotlights, but they just roll up their sleeves and they get things. This is your next blank. Done. They just get things done. I'm reminded of another kingdom laborer named Abel. And Abel is always willing to do whatever physical sort of handyman work, mechanical things need to be done at the church. And there was an emergency. The Saturday before Easter. Everybody goes to church on Easter. And on the Saturday before Easter, the church's sewage tank below and sewage pumps started pumping all the sewage back up into the church floor. And so the pastor arrived about four hours since it started pumping to a church that wasn't in mud puddles of human need, but literally in a sewage puddle. And he thought, I need to call somebody. I can do this on my own. He called up Abel and said, Abel, I need your help. Are you able to do this? I'm sorry. But, but Abel said, sure thing. And Abel works full time. He works two jobs. And he was not on that day. So this was his one day off. Right before Easter. And he said, you know what? I will come in and I will, I will do that. I will do what needs to be done. And, you know, it says here in our, in our book that, you know, we roll up our sleeves and get things done. But you can't roll up your sleeves and avoid sewage when it's up to your knee. You just can't. He came in and he did it anyway. He got things done. And that's what God's calling you to do. He's calling you to meet the need that's in front of you. I've seen him also go up to people in the church and just pray for them and say, I noticed that you're hurting. I noticed that you're more depressed than usual. I noticed that you're kind of chipper, like you're hiding something. He said that to me one time and I was like, how did he see right through me? It's because he was trying to meet the need in the church. It's because he saw me. And he saw, this kid needs something. And he just prayed for me. That's what laborership can look like practically. Going up and praying for people, just being there next to them. That's what people need sometimes. How many times have you been alone thinking, I wish someone was here. I wish I could just cry on their shoulder or give them a hug. I wish I could just lean into somebody and they could support me. I just need support right now. That's a kingdom laborer. Kingdom laborers support people whenever it's necessary. And all of us in this room, again, we are able to do this. We are ordinary people. You don't need to be extraordinary. You don't need to be rich. You don't need to be a perfect speaker. You don't need to be anything other than willing and obedient to Jesus to say, yes, I will labor. You are a laborer if you seek to do what Jesus said is most important. That's your next blank, most important. 
I mean, Jesus has given us the answers to the test here. He's saying this is the most important thing that you can do. We should pay attention here. We should get a magnifying glass and read this so carefully. We should be in tune to his words so diligently. He is giving us the answers. And he said that you should love God with all your, this is the blank, everything. The scripture in Matthew 22 says you should love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Your blank is everything because that is everything. That's encompassing everything, everything in your life you should love God with. There's not one thing in your life that you shouldn't be loving God with. If you have anything in your life that you're saying, I'm going to hide this part of my life from God, but I'll love him over here, you need to get right with God. You need to ask yourself, why am I hiding this? Because Jesus said clearly, love God with everything, nothing left behind. He also said that if you want to come after me, you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. He didn't say deny 90% of yourself or pick up the cross on Wednesdays and Sundays. He said all the time, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And he gave us the second key, which is loving your neighbor out of Matthew 22. That's your second blank there on the bottom half of the page. Love your neighbor. And who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is going to be whoever is next to us at any given time. It's not just the two people or three people or one person that lives in the house next to yours. It's gonna be the person that you are right next to at any time. Right now, Melissa is my neighbor. She's my neighbor. I'm supposed to love my neighbor. So I'm gonna love Melissa and not reject her and neglect her or say, I don't wanna think about her. And then I run over here and I think, my new neighbor's Paul. And I'm not going to be worried about anybody else. I'm going to say, how can I love Paul right now? That's what loving your neighbor is all about. It's about seeing who's right in front of you and just loving them, being self-sacrificing for them and considering them more important than yourself. Romans 10 says, how beautiful are the feet that bring the gospel of peace, that bring good news. And wherever your feet go, there is a gospel opportunity. So you should love your neighbor and share the gospel with them if you get the chance. Then we're moving on to our third point here, and that's going to be on page four. And it says, advance the kingdom every day, everywhere. And it references Acts 8.4. And Acts 8.4 says, so they were scattered and went preaching on their way. Wherever you go, you can preach not only with your words, but you can preach with your life. You can preach with your life by loving God so much that there's an overflow in your life and you can't help but love your neighbor. You can't help it. It's just like a a bar that's constantly filled up. It's just spilling out of you. You don't even have to go in the reserve tank because you love God so much. You're constantly with him. That Your love with God is flowing out onto all the people around you. We see the scripture here, which is reminiscent of Matthew 9, but it's from Luke 10. And it says, he told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out. Jesus is saying to us today, go. I'm sending you out. He's not saying, go home and think about it. He's not. He's saying, go. Go get this done right now. Because what do laborers do? They get things done. They get them done. So we need to go out and get them done. And as mentioned, Romans 10, 15, our next blank, Jesus's plan is a mobile ministry plan. It's not, a, it's not a plan that's just on this stage or just in your church or just in your pastor's office. It is a mobile ministry plan everywhere you go. Someone I work with, he had a burden in his heart for someone that he saw at a gas station. But he was at work and he didn't have time to spend with this person. And he thought, I'm going to go back to this gas station after work. And so six or seven hours pass. He goes back to the gas station. This person is still there because this person is homeless. And they're downtrodden. And they're depressed. And he goes into the gas station and he buys an an iced coffee and a bagel. And he says, I just wanted to give you this. And the person started to cry. And Andrew asked them what was going on. And this person said, tonight, I was going to kill myself. And Andrew felt a tug on his heart at work that he needed to go to this person. 
and he obeyed. He said yes. And that person is alive today because he said yes. What would have happened if he decided to say no, I just want to go home and sit on my couch? What would have happened? He said yes. You need to say yes to Jesus. When you feel those tugs on your heart, just obey. Jesus came down in flesh and dwelt among us, and he had a physical body. But we, as the body of Christ, need to do what he can't physically do. He's with the Father. We are here in these earthly vessels, and we can have Christ in us guide our way. And so we need to ask Jesus to help us do the things he wants to do. Lord, what do you want me to do today? Lord, how do you want me to help my neighbor right now? Lord, how do you want me to help somebody pops in your mind? How do you want me to help my mother when I see her next? How do you want me to help this friend when I see them on Saturday? Lord, I can't help but think about them. If we are saying, God, I want to love them, he's faithful to bless us and tell us exactly what we need to do and guide us in that. So laborership is about loving God loving your neighbor, and advancing the kingdom every single day. And Jesus' heart cry, there's not many prayer requests of Jesus recorded, but this one is. His heart cry is for more kingdom laborers. So we need to commit to being a kingdom laborer today. And I'm so excited to go through this whole journey with you because we're going to delve deeper into what kingdom laborership looks like practically and how you can walk out of this conference and be certain of the purpose that God has made you for, to labor for his kingdom. Now we're gonna split into discussion groups very soon here, but right before we go, we're just gonna all respond out loud to the two, the two bubbles on the bottom of your conference handbook. We're just gonna all say them together if you have your handbook. The first one is, Jesus declared kingdom laborers are the missing ingredient and the world's greatest need. Let's say that one more time. Jesus declared kingdom laborers are the missing ingredient and the world's greatest need. And the second one, kingdom laborers are ordinary people who love God, love others, and advance God's kingdom every day, everywhere. Now you're situated in tables, go split into your tables group and have a response time with the questions on the following pages. And we'll come back in a little bit for the next session.